from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast, where I take calls from business leaders like you about what it takes to win at any stage of business and leadership. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host with over 30 years of experience in the trenches of running, operating, growing, and making a lot of mistakes in business right alongside you. Yeah, you're talking to a practitioner, not talking about theory here. This is real stuff. I did this today, as a matter of fact. So if you got a question, hey, you can call me. The phone number is 844-944-1070, or you can fill out the form at entreeleadership.com slash ask. Put your stuff down. We'll get in touch with you and make you a caller here on the show. Emily will reach out and make sure that you are in line. Janie is going to start off today in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Janie. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hi, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I own a six-unit fast casual restaurant concept here in DFW called the Biscuit Bar, and we just had our fifth birthday. We have about 145 employees, and of course, it's very important to us that we have a personal development program available to them, but we're really running into three big, big roadblocks with this. First, we have, you know, employees who have master's degrees and employees who are at like a third grade reading level and then everything in between. So finding something that's going to help everyone across that scope is, is difficult. Then, of course, we also are in the restaurant industry. We've got slim margins, so our funds for something like this are limited. And then finally, I myself uh, am short on time. Like you always say, I'm the I'm the chief everything officer. But then also I have four littles. So my oldest is six. My youngest is 18 months. I've got two in between there. So, you know, short on time. Uh, so what kind of advice would you have for me uh, in creating a program like that, given those types of constraints? What do you hope to gain by doing a personal development program? What What does winning look like? I would say one one side I would have is a business objective, and then the other would be a, maybe a personal objective. So on the business side, we have currently in the field uh, seventeen. Excuse me, now eighteen. We hired a new one today. Uh, eighteen salaried managers, and up to about fourteen of them were hired as hourly employees. So on the one hand, it's it's definitely much uh, better for us to develop people. On the personal side and the professional how side, how did you how did you do that? Hiring, uh, we really have just trained them hands on. We have um, an LMS platform, a learning management system platform. We put right. a lot of content on mm-hmm. there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, I do have some really you know key generals that are really great at developing people. Also, so you know, together we've kind of uh, raised up some people in the trenches. Uh, but then we also have people who want to grow as a person, but they're not necessarily wanting to grow in leadership, which means more responsibility. So I want to impart them maybe a new mindset or ability to broaden their mind so that if, if, and whenever they do leave us, they can look back and say, wow, I learned some things there that impacted me as a person and, and put me on a different path in life. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure I've got all the answers, but uh, it, it sounds like you're trying to do too many uh, universal things instead of bifurcating this and splitting it up. So I, I would have, um, uh, point. yeah, I would have a 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, 400 level, mm-hmm. like you're going to college. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you're a freshman, you're someone working in the business, not in leadership. Uh, you don't aspire to leadership. Maybe your third grade reading level, what you said, that kind of stuff. So, you know, we might have you start there with life skill stuff. I mean, we might have some marriage curriculum. You might have the Ramsey financial curriculum in there. You might have, um, uh, you know, other relationship tools. Let them take personality Mm -hmm. tests and figure out who they are and how to, you know, communication skills, uh, character training, uh, those kinds of soft skill type things that, that enhance their personal lives. Uh, and then maybe 200 level, I'm making this up on the spot, so it may not be right. Okay. But yeah. then, then, but we do not train people for leadership unless they ask to be. Yes. They have to we raise their the hand. <laughs> they have to raise their hand and say, I want to be in that. Now you don't have to be in leadership 
or you don't ha- we don't even have to believe around Ramsey that you're going to be in leadership, but we have entree leadership classes here at seven o'clock in the morning uh, on uh, Wednesday or Tuesday mornings with free donuts or whatever. And sometimes it's a live teacher, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's one of our other leaders, and we're talking about leadership skills at that point difficult conversations, hiring and firing, all those kinds of things. And if you want to be a leader at Ramsey, you're going to have to have our set of out looking at those things. You're going to have to know how to do that the Ramsey way. And so you're going to have to go through that type of stuff or somehow get that material into your brain. And so, you know, that's an elective. Uh, it's obviously volunteer. It's obviously before work starts. Uh, all those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, it's available. You can make that digital. I don't care because you're spread all over, you know, the, the right. Metroplex there. So we're all in one building. But the, um, so, but, but the point being, so we have a leadership track that's voluntary. And then we have a, uh, an, an advancement of that that we pick the people out of and really lean into them and mentor them. And that would be like of your 14, of your 18 that are 14 of them were homegrown, uh, some of those along the way you looked up and said, I'm going to, that one I'm going to really pour into because they're going to make it. And you change the level of time spent, money spent, emphasis spent on that person's development. And um, and so because they, they not only raised their hands, but they were also demonstrating huge potential and other reasons. It wasn't random. You know, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, that's at least three different buckets right there that I'm thinking of more of a general leadership thing, a life skills thing. And then the, uh, the advanced leadership thing that involves some very hands-on, very, very intentional mentoring, more one-on-one stuff than quote classroom material and, uh, and, and spreading it out that way. The, the other thing that goes with your world that doesn't go with our world is high turnover. Yes. Uh, what the restaurant business is 300% typically. I've got a friend that owns about 20 restaurants and he's got his down to 125%. That blows my mind. Mine is, mine is less than 20%. And it used right. to be less than 10 before all these changes in the marketplace, right? Um, yeah. So I, I, don't, I can't get my head around 300% turnover. But, but that's part of your world too. So that, those people are going to get that life skills uh, modules and that's probably all they're going to get to. Or they right. might get started in some of the early stages of the leadership modules, and then they move on. Uh, and they mm-hmm. take the blessing that you have been with them, and that's fine. And, um, you know, the classic uh, in your world that, that most people recognize is a teenager that works at Chick-fil-A gets a lot more than money working there, the training and the quality of people. And uh, when you come out of that, you, you, you know, you're a different person having worked there as 16, 17, 18 years old. But very few 17-year-olds start at Chick-fil-A with the intent of being there when they're 37. So it's what Chick-fil-A can pour into them while they're there that you're looking at. So, yeah, I think you break it up into different. It might be more than three modules. It might be six. I don't know. But, but think about each of the different groups and quit trying to be, okay, one thing covers all these different things, because it doesn't. It won't work. And uh, yeah, I, I would go a complete, you know, and, and in a sense, that's what we've done here. We have a 100, a 200, a 300, a 400 level of, of different uh, things that we're doing. And um, some of them are very soft skill oriented at the early stages, because there's a lot of people who haven't learned soft skills in our culture today. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ramsey. Well, you've all played the telephone game. The first person whispers a message to the second person who whispers it to the third and so on around the table until the original message has completely changed. Multiply that confusion by 100 if you run a business with different software systems that don't talk to each other. That's why there's NetSuite by Oracle. In the early days of Ramsey, we were using different systems for all of our business units. We needed one single source for accurate data. NetSuite was the software we used to optimize and take us to the next level. NetSuite gave us the visibility into all of our numbers so that we could communicate across departments and plan ahead better. And as we grew, it scaled with us. 
NetSuite worked for Ramsey and it will make a difference for your business too. Join the more than 34,000 customers who trust NetSuite to help make them smarter and make better decisions and level up their operations. To learn more, get a free product tour at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. There are five distinct stages in business. Treadmill operator, to pathfinder, to trailblazer, to peak performer, and finally, to legacy builder. If you feel like you're running on a treadmill and if you stop working, your business income stops, then that means you're a treadmill operator. You're at the first stage. Certainly no shame in that. What's it take to level up? How do you move on down the line and, and, and let your business acumen, your leadership skills, the way your business processes are driven, let it all mature? How do you do that? Well, we'll help you with a digital membership to Entree Leadership Elite. You get a customized plan to help you solve the key challenges you face at your particular stage in business. Help you master your time, help you to delegate better, help you to hire and fire people and get the right people on the bus, as Jim Collins says, the wrong people off the bus, the right people on the seats on the right bus. So sign up for your free, I said it's free, 30-day trial to Entree Leadership Elite. There's a ton of tools in there you're going to want to try. Check out that weekly report. It's a fan fave, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you can get a lot of information from your team doing that. Very easy to do, part of the 30-day trial. Get it all set up at EntreeLeadershipElite.com. EntreeLeadership.com slash elite, I guess I should say. And did I mention that the first 30 days is free? All right, David's with us in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, David. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Um, I have a a dump truck business that I started a few years ago. Uh, Last year, we had revenue of uh, $3.6 million. Uh, Number of employees is 20. Uh, Last year, we bought eight dump trucks. Uh, paid cash for all of them Woo! and uh we're we're on fire we're like a rocket ship we're going straight up man i love it congratulations for those of you listening that don't know what's happening right now we also invite people to call in and just tell their brag story because there's nobody you can brag to when you've got 3.6 million dollars worth of dump trucks running around way to go man whoop, 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 yeah, whoop. thank you very cool how long how old is this business uh, the business started in 2014 on a very weak plan. I I had fifty thousand dollars in the bank, and I said if I bought a loader for fifty thousand dollars and used it one time a year, I would make more money than the interest on the the money. So we bought a loader in that first year. It took off, and by 2016, it, it, it kept on doubling and tripling and doubling and tripling, and and uh, it really just unbelievable where it's ended up. So you're nine years in, you start the thing with one piece of equipment, and it sounds like yeah. uh, you're like, okay, I got this figured out. I know I can make money doing this, but you didn't even have any idea what you're really getting into, did you? Not this time around. So, so I've done it before. And, um, when 2008 came, we were having payments on our equipment of $35,000 a month. And we said, we're not going to make it. And we started selling, we had 40 pieces of equipment at that time and we cut it in half. And then by February of 08, we just said, we better get rid of this stuff or we're going broke. So we sold it all off, put some money in our pockets and then when we started back up again, uh, we didn't have much money. And my wa- my wife, who was my fiance at the time, loaned me fifteen thousand dollars, and we just kind of built it from there. Okay. So, but you said now you're a hundred percent debt free, right? Now we're a hundred percent debt free. And you bought these new trucks debt free. Yeah, they're they're not brand new. Well, I mean, the latest new, the uh, latest round of trucks you bought debt free. Yeah. Correct. Way to go. Very, very and, good. And what we do is we take these old trucks, and sometimes you know you buy them at auction, and you bring them home, and they're not what you thought they were, and you put as much money in them as uh, 
a use as you paid for it, but now you know what you have. You got a reliable truck because you rebuilt the motor, did bushings, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Way to go. Way to go. So uh, why is business so good with real estate being slow? Um, well, my past history, these, these, um, being in this business, um, people that used to be laborers, foremen, superintendents for me now work for these other big companies. And we took really good care of them back in the day. And now they're paying me back by going, Dave, we want you back. Yeah. And, uh, it came back around full circle and now we're so established with all the large uh, contractors in town. Uh, we're first call with many of them. Yeah. And, and we also have um, about 10 to 15 subcontractors with dump trucks that work for us. And we take a broker fee on it. And so we put out 20 to 25 trucks every single day. Wow. Wow. Way to go, man. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. Thank you very much. All right. So a uh, young dude's out there listening right now. He's in his 20s, and he's got a little bit of money scraped together, and he's thinking about going in debt to buy a couple pieces of equipment. What are you going to tell him? Don't do it. What, how, should, how, it. Should, how should he do it? If, he, if he's not going to go in debt, how's he going to do it? He's going to save every penny and work day and night and not go out and eat and not go buying a brand-new pickup truck. You are last. You get rewarded last. Yeah, and then later you get rewarded first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so currently today, we'll say like this morning, I get up this morning with my beautiful wife, and we go play pickleball, and I go to work at nine o'clock, and today I will get off work at three thirty, and. I'm working six hours a day. Some days, if I want to, I hop in a dump truck and I cover someone or I hop on a loader and, and cause I like to do that stuff, Yeah. but yeah. I'm not in the, I'm not in the treadmill that I have to, right. I do it because I like to oh, you're equipment's definitely the, fun to me. Yeah. You're definitely a trailblazer, a peak performer. One of the two when, based on what you're telling me, way to go, man. So proud of you, man. That is very, very cool. And tell me that you can't make it in America today. Capitalism is broken. $3.8 million worth of volume on dump trucks. I don't think anything is broken out there. Except some of you people's viewpoints. Wow. That's impressive, David. Proud of you, man. Love hearing stories like that. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, welcome back to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hey, if you want to join the show as a caller, all you got to do is call the number 844-944-1070. That's 844-944-1070. And of course, you can leave a message at entreeleadership.com slash ask about what you would like to ask on the show. We don't tell you what to say. We just line up the call and... Uh, Emily and the team will take great care of you. Make sure you're all lined up and make you part of this. Hey, guys, around here at Entree Leadership, we have observed businesses for the past couple of decades and have observed and studied our own growth over the last 30-plus years and figured out that there are five stages of business. You go from treadmill operator to pathfinder to trailblazer to peak performer and finally to legacy builder when we start talking about and actually do succession. As you go through, and as we have gone through, treadmill operator, I started this company as a on a card table in my living room, and later there were just a handful of us, and, um, you know, later on somebody invented the internet, and, you know, all this, right? So like, as we've gone through these stages over the years, and there's not necessarily a certain number of years, but we have observed that there were areas of competency that as we took those areas of competency and got better at them, we tended to move through the stages. We call those the drivers of business. The first one is your personal driver. 
And, and with this, we talk a lot about what John Maxwell says, that you're the lid on your business. I'm the lid on my business. The guy in my mirror is holding my business back more than almost anything else. So you personally have to grow. You personally have to continue to work on your character. You continually work on your uh, psychological well-being, your mental health. You work on your emotional and spiritual well-being. And you're reading and growing, and you know things that you didn't know. I have read so many books in the last 32 years on business uh, that it blinds me when I think about it. I've forgotten more than I used to know. And so there you go. So you constantly have to be growing. If you're not growing, don't expect your business to. And then once you've got, you know, you say checkbox, well, maybe, but it's never really checked because it's an ongoing thing. All of these drivers you're continually driving on. You need to make sure that you have a real strong purpose for your business. Business is bigger than the bottom line. If you're just working for money, you're not going to last. You won't stick out. You won't, you won't plow through. You won't, I just came out of a discussion a few minutes ago in a meeting. Listen, on principle, we have to know that this move that's going to make us a lot of money is not going to just make us a lot of money, that the customers involved are going to have their lives changed. If not, then this is just a money grab, and we don't do that at Ramsey. I just had that discussion a few minutes ago, and so that's purpose. We have to have a purpose that is bigger, badder, cooler than simply making money. Making money is a good thing. Go make you some money. I'm all about you getting some money. That's fine. But if that's all you're in it for, you're a little slimy. You need a purpose, something noble, bigger than that. If you're, if you're working on you and you got a good, strong purpose, you got to have the right people. Jim Collins says we have to have the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus, and get the right people on the right seats on the bus. Building a unified team, team building, hiring and firing is the key to winning in business. The most rewarding thing you will ever do in business is your team, and the most frustrating, maddening thing you will ever do in business is your team. I mean, it, it's crazy, the stuff that people that used to work here will say that they never would have said when they were working here. I mean, they, they, but, but once you get away, you know, you just, oh, my gosh, right? So it, it hurts your feelings. I remember when you worked here, and you didn't act that way, and, and, and you weren't that, you know. And, and now here you are being a, yeah, you're one of those. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I remember, and, and, and it's also rewarding, go, the guy that left here and has opened and is running this massive business, and, and he credits some of the success that he's had to the, what he learned when he worked here. Thank you. I appreciate that. And no, I did, I'm not completely the reason for his success. I didn't say that. I said some of his success is due to what he learned while he worked here. People are both rewarding and frustrating. When they're on the team, they're both rewarding and frustrating. The people problems, the, the, the small-mindedness of uh, the light is bothering me. Oh, kiss my butt. Oh, seriously. You know, the, the, the pettiness of stuff. And it's like, oh, God, get your fingernails. Get some dirt under your fingernails. Come on. Come on. Scratch a little bit. Claw a little bit. Get something done here, baby. Come on. Be somebody. You know, get up off your assumptions and go do something. I mean, seriously. And then on the other hand, they're so rewarding because they come up with great ideas. And they're smarter than me. And they work. And sometimes they're working harder than me. And, and very seldom. But that happens sometimes. And, and you know, I mean, you get, they come in and, and you know, and, and they're just good human beings. High character, high quality, care, take care of their wife, take care of their husband, love their kid. I mean, I just love being around people like this and, and having them on the team. It's the best thing ever happened. People are your biggest blessing and your biggest problem and their biggest line item in your P&L too. So biggest investment, psycholo I mean, psychologically and financially. Then that leads us to having a plan. You better have a plan because if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time, Zig Ziglar said. And he was right. Winning is an intentional act. It doesn't happen by accident. Henry Cloud says you need a desired future. Pat Lencioni says you need a thematic goal. I don't care what the flip you call it, but you better have a target, baby. And you better be pulling that arrow back and letting it fly straight right at the bullseye. Otherwise, you're one of those stupid redneck kids like I used to be standing in the background, backyard shooting your arrow up in the air, straight up in the air, and hoping it don't come down in the top of your head, right? 
and just watch it go into space and disappear and then look for it to come back down and hope it misses you. Oh my God. That's what you're doing. If you're working without a plan, you don't, don't be that dumb kid. I was, I actually did that crap, yeah. but I grew up in the generation where we actually had lawn darts. Some fool invented the idea for children to throw pointed objects at each other through the air and then, and, and didn't think we were going to play chicken with them. Come on. What were you thinking? So, no, you need a plan. You need something you are aimed at on purpose. And then and only then do you need a product. You need to design your product and your service, your offering. What is your brand proposition? What is your value proposition? What's your brand differentiation? What, what is the, what, what, why does your customer care to give you their time or their money, right? And, and, and boy, if you've got a product that's moving, and you got good people and you got a good plan and you got a purpose and you're you're on fire and you're growing as a person, then it will naturally lead you to the sixth driver, which is profit. And profit is good. Profit is gas in the tank to go do more. Because as soon as you come around that circle of those six drivers, and they are circular, it leads you right back to personal. The more profit you make, the more you better be having your character straight. Because money will ruin a bad person. Well, no, it actually exposes the fact that they're bad. Money will make a good person? No, no, it actually exposes the very fact that they're good. That's what happens. And then purpose, yeah, you, your, your purpose gets deeper the more money you got. More, the more you have to manage, the more you have to watch, the more responsibility you have, and, and the more people you have because you're going to get more people and more expensive people too. They start costing more. Yeah. yeah. And then your plan. Oh, God, it goes from having a plan to now I actually have to have a strategy. God help me. Now, we went from planning to strategy, and then I got really scary that we were getting wonky. But, hey, you got to have a strategy if you're going to be big. You can't just have a plan. And then your product's got to get better and bigger. And, oh, by the way, if your product's not iterating in a fast-changing market, you're already dead. Nobody told you yet. There you go. And then more profit comes, doesn't it? Yep. Profit is the applause your customers give you, Ken Blanchard says. Rabbi Daniel Lappin says that when your customers love you, they give you certificates of appreciation with president's faces on them. So expect the profits to come. That's the six drivers, and as you go through those six drivers, ever so often as you get better at each of those, and they lead to each other, and they get better and better and better and better and better, it spirals upward, and it'll cause you to level up through the five stages of business. And you'll move from treadmill operator to pathfinder to trailblazer to peak performer to legacy builder. And that's how we have done it, and that's how you'll do it if you're going to do it even if you don't admit that you're doing it. The Entree Leadership System is actually proven facts. It's what happens in business, particularly small business. So if you're out there with five to 200 team members, you're in one of these different five stages, you're running a 10,000-person publicly traded company. I'm really not talking to you. You're welcome to listen, but that's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to people like me, the backbone of America, small business. We love you, and we are here for you. So be sure you check out the Entree Leadership System, the six drivers and the five stages. Identify where you are and what you got to work on to level up, baby, and we'll help you. It's what we do. Check out Elite at EntreeLeadership.com. It's free for the first 30 days. Have I mentioned to you before that it's free? You should check it out. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ramsey. In case you didn't know, our producer is Austin Shelby. Selby. I didn't know, apparently. And um, Will Rudder is running the board today. Andrew and Nathan are back there turning their knobs. And uh, Emily is on the phones making things happen. This does not occur without the booth people. The booth people are important. Um, because I don't even turn on the microphone at the right time most of the time. So... I have will to make sure that it goes off when it's supposed to go off and all that kind of stuff. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. If you want to be part of this show, you can call us at 844-944-1070 or leave a, uh, a little message about what you want to talk about at entreeleadership.com slash ask. And Miss Emily will call you and put you uh, on the air. And uh, we'll talk to you about your business issues. Ben is with us in Huntsville. Hey, Ben, welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hey, Dave. Glad to be with you, sir. You too. What's up? So I, I run a research firm, have two team members, about 700K in revenue last year. And I'm talking with a company in the space, uh, a gentleman I've known for a couple of years, that's similar size to ours and kind of complimentary. 
to what we do. And he's thinking about selling his business. And I've, I've heard you talk through this story lots of times with people, but the unique wrinkle is he wants to stick around after that as an individual contributor. And I wanted to know your thoughts on that. Why does he want to sell? He is an amazing salesperson. Got into the, the e-myth trap where he does not like running the business. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, I think the, uh, the series of conversations that you're going to have over the time that he's with you, uh, if he stays, is going to be talking a lot about how difficult it is for a normal human to have been the boss and then not be the boss. It's just That's hard. A difficult transition to make. Yes. It's just hard. I mean, you're used to barking and people jump. You're used to uh, your ideas matter more than they do later. <laughs> you're used to, there's a certain kind of weird humility, not humiliation, but humility that would be required. It can be done. It can be done. I've got a uh, an operating board member that ran his own deal for years and came in here and is an excellent team member and works as a great, not only a great leader, but also a great team member with other leaders. And so he's, he's really good with people. And so he's been able to make that transition, but he was self-employed, ran a good-sized business for a lot of years. And, um, you know, he sold it and came to work here. And uh, he made that transition. But, you know, let's just say out loud that we talked about that a lot. And, um, and, and you know, we, we didn't stop talking about it the day he started. Um, and that's going to be with you. So you say, okay, look, going to be some awkward conversations and some awkward feelings. And if we don't have those, you and I, then we're probably weird. It would be normal to have some awkwardness. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And if we can just keep talking about the awkwardness, it makes it go away. The, the benefit I think in this is that he, he bought it out, bought someone else out about two years ago. So he hasn't been the boss for all that, for the entire duration. So that's a, I think a good thing here. And he doesn't want be, to be, be the alternative. boss anymore, but he has had that part of his wiring done. So you, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to, that, that they're just, Know that it's real. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying it's not possible to do it. I just gave you an example where we did do it. Um, but but I, I think you just say out loud, the, in a normal situation, if someone had been running a business for 25 years and they sell it, they might stay on a year to make sure that the key team members stick and that the key accounts, the uh, customers stick, right? Uh, and then they'll, mo- they'll ha- get a good handoff and then out the door, you know, inside of 12 months. That's a typical scenario where the former owner stays on long enough to make that happen. Uh, but in your case, you're trying to turn him into a top, top flight sales guy again, right? Yeah. He, he is so aching to be back in that role. And every time I talk to him, that's the, the thing that comes through every conversation. And that excites me because that's not my area of expertise, but I would try it. A thing I, like I mean, I, I'm not telling you don't do it. I'm just telling you that human nature is there's going to be a few moments here or there where there's a bit of an eye roll by one of you. And we've just got to be able to go, Hey, this is a little bit weird right now. Let's just pull aside, have a cup of coffee, breathe a second. And, um, oh, okay. That's good. Now we're back on. Okay. And you just gotta, you know, you gotta have a, you, you're going to have to leave the emotional margin and set the table as such to be able to have a couple of resets as you go along. I've, the, the first part I'm planning on talking about is the comp piece because he's going to leave the, I get to pay myself a salary now and I'm going to be sales. So it's going to be commission driven after that. So that's going to be part of the, the initial part mechanically. But yeah. I think it's a, a good point to say, oh, by the way, there's lots of other things that are not written down that are going to be part of this that we need to talk through. Yeah. And we just, if you're feeling awkward, you know, part of our bargain is, part of our agreement is you're going to come into my office and we're going to sit down and talk about it. If I'm feeling or sensing some awkwardness, I'm not going to brush it under the rug and go, oh, well, it'll work out because it won't work out. You got to sit down and talk about it because the weird thing about these things are th- these little co- miniature conflicts is they avoid huge conflicts later. You, you, you can do minor course corrections, right? 
like a 2% two percent course correction avoids the dadgum ship from sinking later, right? Because we don't hit the reef. And so we're just going to, I just like, I believe in lots of that stuff. That's why I hate the idea of an annual review with a typical team member. Once a year, we sit down and talk. Well, no, crap, we're going to talk all the time. Where the annual review, we'll do an annual review, but it's irrelevant because you already know everything I'm thinking because I'm, I'm not waiting a year to tell you. Oh, my gosh. You know, so that that's where corporate America screws up. I'm scared about my annual review. You don't ever need to be scared about your annual review at Ramsey because we've already told you what's going on before you come in there. Long, many times, you know. So same thing here. Course correct, course correct, course correct. And, you know, and you can set the comp thing up where he's salary – and progressively, it takes a year or six months or something to fade over into uh, commission, and uh, so he's not. So he does, his finances don't get uh, some kind of culture shock or something. You can set that up, but but I'm just saying the the guys are used to reporting to him. They're not reporting to him anymore, and they can't anymore. They're not allowed to. So they can't have like a second meeting with their old boss after you've just had a meeting with them. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. That's the kind of crap leaving that guy in there can occur. And it's human nature because they're comfortable with him. They trust him and you're the new guy. And so they don't like something they heard. They may not come to you. They may go to him and he's going to have to deflect and go, no, you're going to Ben's office. Mm -hmm. And uh, are, you and I will talk to Ben about it. Ben, ben will talk to you about it. He's not mad. Let's talk about it. Let's all go in there and talk together. I mean, and he's got to have your back in that sense. Um, otherwise he becomes a distraction and you'll have a really great salesperson who's, uh, causing division inside the company. Uh, and it was unintentional, but it's just human nature for people to stick with people they already know and trust and that kind of thing. So just, just set the table by that. I mean, let's, uh, you know, okay, here's going to be our comp plan and here's going to be our agreement. Every time you feel awkwardness, you're going to talk to me. I'm going to talk to you if I feel it. In, I mean, within a, within a few minutes, if we can get to each other. The second thing is, if somebody comes to you and they are uncomfortable, it's no longer your job to mentor them or to hear them out. You can take them by the hand and walk in my office, and the three of us will solve it together, and then we'll all be friends and trust each other going forward. you got to have my back, and you got to deflect their stuff to me rather than uh, accidentally causing division. If we get those three things going, comp, constant flow of communication, you probably can make this turn with this guy because he doesn't want the job. He hasn't been doing the job very long, both to your point. That's your points, and they're excellent points. Um, and, you know, I, I that this will work. But uh, it's it would be very difficult to hire someone who used to run half the place to come in and run none of the place. And uh, that's it, just a hard thing for humans to get their head around. It'd be hard for the team to see that and understand and, and compute that. It's like, uh, you know, it can be done, though. It can be done. But you, uh, the only way is with lots of intentionality and discussion. Don't just plug and play and hope it all works out. Uh, if you're very proactive, in other words, that, that's where I think you'll make the turn with it. So very, very good question. Very cool. Proud of you, man. Sounds like a fun deal you're doing. Getting ready to double the size of your firm, get some talent on board, get things moving in the right direction. Man, it's excellent, excellent stuff. Proud of you. Good, good work. Very good. Hey, guys, remember, better a weary warrior than a quivering critic. Leaders serve. Leaders are active, not passive. Leaders act on principle, not appearances. This world desperately needs more high-quality leaders. So choose to lead. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thanks for listening to the Entree Leadership Podcast.